morning, I just feel like the Lord just gave me a little bit of a word of knowledge, and that is that some people have been really consumed with all the nonsense that goes on in the body of Christ, and even in the world around them, whether it be politics, but it's really politics, politics in the church and politics in the world. But it's like what the Lord is showing me is that some people are taking too much of that on themselves, like there's too much of a heaviness concerning it. Like there's too much of a, like yes, we are supposed to grieve for the things that go on in the body of Christ that aren't right, but that is His weight and not ours. And that you need to just continually give that over to Him. Stop fretting, stop worrying about all the stuff. I don't know who that's for, but I know it's for someone. Stop letting your mind race. Stop wondering what you're gonna, gonna say to them or how you're gonna behave. You just press into the Lord, you focus on Him. And He's gonna be with you and He's gonna show you. But also, it's like it's gone over into an area where you're not supposed to be carrying what you're carrying the way you're carrying it. And the Lord sees that and He knows it. And He says, hand that weight over to me. His yoke is easy and His burden is light. And He doesn't want you carrying all that stuff. And you know, even with your family, there's someone here who carries too much for your family. He is the Holy Spirit. You are not. He is God. You are not. I am not. He says, cast all your cares on me, for I care for you. Cast it over, roll it over on him. That's what the Amplified Bible says. Just roll it over. Just admit and say, God, I can't do it. I need you. I need your help. Lay down every weight. Lay down every thought. All the mind racing spirits and those things that would try and come against you. Lord, we just say today that you are God. We say that you are God and not us. We say that you are more than capable of dealing with whatever goes on. And that our worry can add nothing to it. So right now in Jesus' name, Lord, take it all. We roll it over onto you, knowing that you're our Father, that you are good and that you care for us, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, thank you, Lord. Whatever it may be, just go ahead and do that now. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord, that you care for us, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that you carry every burden and every weight. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Oh, we're so grateful, God. We praise you. We magnify you, Lord. We glorify you, God. We glorify you, Jesus. Almighty God. Almighty Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh, we praise you. We glorify you. You. We glorify you, Jesus. Oh God, we praise you, Lord. Oh God, we praise you, Lord. Oh God, we praise you, Lord. Oh, we bless you. Oh, we bless you, God. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, we glorify you, Jesus. We glorify. 
Help it to be so real. Lord, revelation, understanding. Not just mental agreement. We worship you, Jesus.
thank you for that love. Thank you for that love, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for the price you paid. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Jesus, we love you, Jesus. Oh, we, we praise, praise you, God. Name. Oh, we bless you, God. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. Praise you, God. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Oh, bless your name, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus.
I'd rather be. best place to be, ladies and gentlemen. 
Praise you, Lord. Jesus, I am so glad that in those times when I feel out of sorts, in those times when there's just something unsettling, you hold me still and you always hold me near. I thank you for that, Lord. I thank you for that. And we know, Jesus, that we can never encounter anything, anything that you have not already seen in advance. You already have an answer for it. You already have a solution for it. That's why we can just rest in your arms of love, Jesus. That's why we can rest in your arms of love. So on this day, Lord Jesus, we give you all the praise. We give you all the glory. And we thank you, Lord, once again for loving us so much that you would hang on that tree and that you would die for us so that we could live with you forever. This is your... This is your day, Jesus. Whatever you want to accomplish today, we are here for that. We give you all the praise, we give you all the glory, and let the church say, Amen. Find a brother and sister, let them know you're glad to see them. Turn with me, put a, put a marker in Matthew chapter 4, but we're going to begin in Second Peter chapter 1. One of the things that I have encountered over the years is that Christians believe that they can take the Bible, they can read the Bible, and that they can say, this is what this means to me. Okay? When you take that approach with the Bible, you might as well say, okay, God, you're not involved. Okay, you're just, you're just on the sidelines. You are not involved whatsoever. Because the only way that we are going to come to an understanding of what this book is all about starts with understanding 2 Peter chapter 1, look at verse 20. Knowing this first. Okay? Knowing this first that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. Now, God really drives that point home with the word no, because the word no is O-U, and we've talked about that before. It means absolutely not, no way, no exception, forget about it. Okay? So he's saying that knowing this first, that there is no prophecy and don't take the word prophecy mean as thus saith the Lord. He's talking about this book. Okay? There is no prophecy of the scripture that is of any private interpretation. Okay? There is none. You cannot read the Bible and say, okay, this is what it means to me. Tabitha can say, well, this is what this verse means to me. Stephen can say, oh, but this is what this verse means to me. No. The verse means what it means. Okay? It means what it means. And see, God drives this point home with verse 21. He says, for the prophecy came not, that word not is also O-U. For that prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. In other words, man didn't just decide to sit down and write the Bible. I'm going somewhere with this, okay? He just didn't sit down and decide to write the Bible. So many folks in the body of Christ believe that there are 66 books, and all of them were written by men. The Bible says, For the prophecy came not, there was in old time by the will of man. In other words, man had nothing to do with writing the Bible. Say it with me. Man had nothing to do with writing the Bible. Okay? And we see it in the verse, but holy men of God spake as they were moved upon by the Holy Ghost. 
holy men of God sat at the feet of the teacher and took dictation. Okay, took dictation. When it comes to how we interpret this book, one of the things we've been taught over and over and over is you never take passages or scriptures out of its setting. Okay? You leave it in the context. And there are other things that also help you understand what a verse and a context and, and, and the context is saying, and we're not going to get into that this, this morning. But I want to mention that to you because there are so many times that we will read the Bible, we'll see a word in the Bible, and we think we understand what that word means, that one singular word, okay? Over the past few weeks, the Lord has had me just camping on some different words. And one of those words that we're going to look at this morning is the word if, I-F. Now, you look at the word if, and when you see it, I'm really limiting myself to the New Testament, we see it as saying the same thing each time we see it, okay? But there are two Greek words for the word if. One is ice. Eyes, and that's E I, and the one and the other one is E N E A N. We're not going to talk about E N this morning. We're going to focus on I this morning. Okay. And the reason for that is because the word I for if it presents a hypothetical situation to the person who's reading it. Okay. It presents a hypothetical situation to the person who is reading it. The person then who is reading that hypothetical situation, and I'm going to use the word hypothetical truth. It's really not a hypothetical truth, but it's a hypothetical truth until you believe it. Are you following me? Okay. So, it presents a hypothetical truth that must be understood, It must be believed, and it must be acted on. Brother Barry, what are you saying? When you, and I I want you, when you go home, or when you have your study, to look up the word if, E-I, okay? And everywhere you find it in the Bible, note it. Because the only way that that if can be a part of your life is you have to understand it, you have to believe it, you have to act upon it. And the only way you can do it, ladies and gentlemen, is by faith. It's by faith. There's no other way than by faith. Okay? When we understand the if, when we believe the if, and then we act on the if in faith, It ceases to be hypothetical. It becomes a reality in our lives. It becomes a reality in our lives. The thing that if, and again, I'm focused on the word I, E-I, is the thing that that word if brings our attention to, it shows us, ladies and gentlemen, where we are in our obedience to God and where we are in our fellowship with God. Are you following me? It's going to be an indicator of where we are in our obedience and where we are in our fellowship. Okay? Whether or not we choose to act on that hypothetical truth does not negate the fact that it's true. It doesn't negate the fact that it's true. Our response will either be one of faith or unbelief. That's the only two choices we have, faith or unbelief. And I'm going to put it to you a different way. Not acting on the hypothetical truth points to another truth, that there is a level of pride operating in us. If we don't believe what we read in here, there is a level of pride operating in us. 
By not, by not acting, mentally we are saying, I don't believe it, or I don't have to do it, or it doesn't apply to me. Are you following me? How many of you know that there are folks in the body of Christ that believe the Old Testament does not apply to them? Okay? That's a big mistake, ladies and gentlemen. Because a lot of what Jesus taught had its basis, its foundation for the people. You can find it in the New Testament, I mean Old Testament. What he does, he says, now, this was the Old Testament, now this is now the kingdom of God. Okay? I'm going to do something real quick, kind of opposite of my notes. I want you to look, I want you to see how this plays out fairly quickly. And then we're going to, you're in Matthew chapter 4, right? Hold your place there and we'll go to Matthew chapter 6. In Matthew chapter 6, uh, verses we're very familiar with, ladies and gentlemen. And we're talking about the verse being a hypothetical truth to us until we act, understand it, believe it, and act on it. Very familiar verses. For if, that word if is I, okay? And I is a hypothetical truth that we need to understand, believe, and act on. Are you following me? For if ye forgive them their trespasses, your heavenly father, oh, I'm sorry, verse 14. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly father will also forgive you. Okay? Why is that a hypothetical truth? Because the only thing we have to go on is the fact that God said it. There is nothing in our lives that would indicate that that's the case. Is that not true? The only way we can believe that is by faith that God said it. Are you following me? Then the verse 15 says, but if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your father forgive you. How do we know that? He has told us that. There is nothing in this world that will Help us understand that if we don't forgive, God is not going to forgive us. Nothing. We have to take that statement by faith. So what does the if statement, if, what does if communicate? It communicates our level of, of obedience, number one, and then our level of fellowship with God. Now notice I use the word fellowship. I didn't say relationship. The relationship is we're sons, we're daughters. But the fellowship has degrees of fellowship. Because the more you agree with your father, the more that you agree with what his word says, the more intimate the fellowship. Are you following me? Okay? So the Bible says that if we, if for if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly father will forgive you. But if you don't, your heavenly father will not forgive you. And the only way we know that is because that is what the Bible says. I'm going to tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. You would not know that by the way Christians live. Let me back up. Because, I mean, I don't want to paint all of you with one broad brush. I'm going to say most of the body of Christ, you would not know that by the way they live. Okay? Now, why is our willingness to forgive so very important? What is it that forgiveness impacts or lack of forgiveness impacts? Okay? Go back up to verse 5. And when thou prayest, verse 6, but thou, when thou prayest, verse 7, but when ye pray, verse 9, after this manner, therefore, pray ye, and then verse 12, and forgive us our debt as we forgive our debtors. What is this telling us, ladies and gentlemen? Your forgiving someone 
or not forgiving someone will determine your prayer life, will determine answers to prayer. Because you cannot live in unforgiveness and expect God to leap over that unforgiveness and answer your prayer. It is not going to happen. Period. Okay? God is not going to tell you to forgive and you don't forgive and then he's going to turn around and say, okay, Barry didn't forgive, I'm going to answer his prayer anyway. No, God is not like that. People are like that. But God is not like that, okay? If you are holding unforgiveness anywhere in your life, you need to get rid of it real quick, ladies and gentlemen, because it is putting a big 200, a big 200,000 pounds of mint block on top of your prayer, and it's not going to get answered, Okay? Do you see how important that one little word, if, is? Because it indicates your level of obedience to God and then your willingness, I mean, your willingness to obey and then the type of relationship you have. If you struggle with that, then you know right now that I have to do something about why I don't believe this and I have to do something about what's going on in my relationship, my fellowship with my father that needs to change. Okay. I want to look at Matthew chapter 4. Because in Matthew chapter 4, this is the very first time this Greek word EI or I is used. And whenever, when it comes to studying the Bible, understanding what Scripture says, Many times, often, the first time a word is used tells you a lot about what's going on with that word. Okay? So let's begin. And we're only going to look at four verses. So let's begin with chapter, chapter 4, verse 1. Then, stop. What happens before then? (laughs) Stephen says something else. (laughs) Let's go back up to chapter 3, verse 13. I see then again. But the difference with this then and the other then is that this one signals that this is the first time we're going to see Jesus mentioned in Matthew chapter, well, after his birth, in Matthew chapter 3. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? And Jesus answered him and said, Suffer it to be so now. For thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. What does it mean to fulfill all righteousness? In a nutshell, to fulfill all the righteousness of the law in a nutshell. So that's why, remember, that's why Jesus came, to fulfill the law and to fulfill all the righteousness of the law. Verse 16, and Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straight out of the water. I remember for so many years, I saw Jesus being baptized, he was just literally rising up out of the water. And then God speaking to him, saying, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Didn't happen that way. When it says Jesus came straightway out of the water, he was baptized, he just walked out of the water onto the bank. How simple is that? <laughs> I mean, how simple is that? <laughs> he baptized, just walks out of the water. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were open unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. That's important. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. No, what's important is he heard a voice, and the voice was a spoken word. Are you following? Verse 1 of chapter 4. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. 
What spirit led Jesus up to be tempted? Just want to make sure you understand what spirit, okay? Because, see, the Bible says, Jesus said, the Holy Ghost, the Comforter, will come, lead, and guide us. Are you following me? Okay. I've been saying that a lot already this morning, haven't I? Are you following me? Okay, raise your hand, the person who's not following me, that's why I keep saying it. No takers? <laughs> God got no takers whatsoever. <laughs> then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. That word tempted, it means to test, scrutinize, entice, discipline, examine, prove. I'm going to focus on two words, to scrutinize and examine. All temptation is designed, well, let me keep it in this context, okay? When it says that Jesus was being led to be tempted of the devil, what the devil was going to do He's, see, when Jesus goes up to be tempted, the devil already knows who he is. Okay, remember all the children who were killed to try to find him? So the devil knows who he is. So the devil then, what temp, what, when he says to be tempted, scrutinize, he wants to find out who Jesus, does Jesus understand who he really is? He's measuring the man. Are you following? I'll say it again. He's measuring the man. He's sizing him up. He's sizing him up. How many of you have done that? You met someone and you sized that person up based on the things that the person says, based on the things that the person does. You size that person up. The devil was going to size Jesus the devil is going to size you up. The devil is going to measure you. The devil is going to scrutinize you. He's going to examine you. In the same way he did to Jesus. Okay? Now this word devil is a word we're very familiar with, diablos. Is one who falsely accuses. And we know that in 1 John, I mean in John chapter 4, 8 verse 4, verse John 8, slow down Barry. John 8 verse 44, it says that he is, he is a liar and the father of lies. Okay? Satan is a liar and the father of lies. When the Bible says he's the father of lies, that means that there were no, there were no liars before him. Or do you see this? There were no liars before him. Okay? And so, Diablos is one who falsely accuses and divides people without any reason. How does he divide people? I have a one-word answer. Emotions. That's a one-word answer of how he divides people. Now, unfortunately, and I'm only speaking to the body of Christ, unfortunately, he divides the body of Christ with a lot of low-hanging fruit. Okay? Jamie, when she, when she was speaking prophetically this morning, talked about how, you know, politics divides us or how we have disagreements over politics. That's a low-hanging fruit. Are you following me? When people talk about racism, that's a low-hanging fruit. When people talk about wage inequality, that's a low-hanging fruit. When people talk about um, same-sex marriage and, and disagree over it, that's a low-hanging fruit. Let's go a little higher up the tree. It's, a, it's, it's still a low-hanging fruit, but denominations is a low-hanging fruit when it comes to talking about how Satan 
divides us. Let me ask the question this way. And instead of using the word divide, what is it that Satan wants to separate Christians from? The Bible, the word. That's what he wants to separate us from. This is the fruit that he wants to separate us from. Everything else, ladies and gentlemen, is low-hanging. Everything else is re- everything else is the result of him having already separated us from this. And I get so angry sometimes when I hear Christians talking about different things, because that, that tells me right off the bat that number one, they are living in rebellion, they're living in, they're not being obedient, and they have no fellowship with their father. None. I know right off the bat. That's easy to identify. So we see then that Satan wants to divide us based on our emotions with low-hanging fruit. And we are so accommodating. So accommodating. Verse 2. And when he had fasted, Jesus fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterwards a hungry, a hungered. Verse 3, and when the tempter came, when the tempter came, mark it down, he is coming, if he's not already arrived in your life. He's coming. It's not no if, answer, but he is coming. And the word, remember how we talked about the word scrutinize? It means, tempted means to scrutinize, to examine. And then diabolos means uh, to falsely accuse. And in the past, I've talked about diabolos being like a dripping of water until he makes a, in, like water dripping, until you make an indention in stone or wood. The tempter is coming to continuously drip on you, drip on you, drip on you, as he's examining your life, as he's scrutinizing your life, And what is he examining and scrutinizing, ladies and gentlemen, in your life? Are you living by this word, this book? And in those places where he finds out that you are not living by this book, he's going after you. He's coming after you. Okay? Brother Barry. We hadn't talked about if yet. It's coming. It's coming. Okay? Satan's purpose in tempting us is to find out how intimate your fellowship is with the Father and with his Son. Hold your finger here and go to 1 John chapter 3. Why is, how is it that we develop Fellowship with our Father. First John chapter 1, verse 3 says, That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you. What is John, who is John referred to? From his relationship, from his interaction with Jesus. That which we have seen and heard we declare to you. And also with the Holy Spirit. So he's talking about the word. That which we have seen declare unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us. You cannot have fellowship with someone if you are not in agreement with someone. Do you see this? That you may have fellowship with us, and truly, the fellowship you are really having is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. That's really the fellowship you're having. And why do we want to have fellowship? And these things write we unto you, These things we write unto you, why? That your joy may be full. Regardless of the circumstance. Regardless of the situation. That your joy may be full. Okay? We're still here in Matthew chapter 4. Remember when I said that the tempter wants to scrutinize and to examine you? 
We see this in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, where it says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, as God said. That is a scrutinizing, that is an examining question. Scrutinizing the knowledge of what God has said, examining whether you believe what God has said. Now the serpent was more so than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Okay, back to Matthew chapter 4. For our purposes is, did God really say, fill in the blank, did God really say that? Did God really say that you should not commit adultery? Did he really say that? Did God really say you should not steal? Did God really say that? Did God really say that homosexuality, that lifestyle is wrong? Did he really say that? Do you know people believe that Jesus never addressed that issue? I'm serious. They believe Jesus never addressed that issue. I wish I could find it on top of my head, but I'm I'm going to tell you how Jesus addressed the issue. He says, have you not heard that from the beginning he made them male and female? Okay? And the question he was answering was the Pharisees had come to him about divorce. So So when he says male and female, He's saying, have you not heard that from the beginning he made them husband and wife? You follow me? So Jesus talked about that. But there are so many in the church that are living a lifestyle that are so compromised that they don't want to see that. Even when it's presented to them in black and white, they don't want to see it. Okay. Now we also know that it's it's more than just knowing what God says. The bottom line is, do you believe what God says? Okay. Do you believe what God says when everyone else is telling you you're wrong? Not no. Okay, I want to back up from that generalization. Do you believe what God says when, when there are many folks who are telling you you are wrong? That's, that is where the rubber meets the road. That is where the line is drawn in the sand. That is where you find out how obedient you are and the kind of intimate fellowship you have, whether or not you are willing to stand there in that place of agreeing with Scripture when folks don't agree with you. Okay? So the question Satan was asking Eve was, do you have the kind of fellowship with God that when he speaks, you believe him without question, no matter what he says? That's the question for us. Okay? And we know the, in Titus that it says, God cannot lie. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 5, it says that God is light, and in him is no, the word no is O you again, absolutely not, none, not, you will never find it, no darkness in him, okay? But the one I want to read to you real quick is one of my favorite ones. It's in Numbers chapter 23. And it's the passage where Balaam has had his donkey handed to him (laughs) and now he sees things the way God sees things okay verse 19 of Numbers chapter 23 God is not a man that he should lie neither the son of man that he should repent as he said and shall he not do it or has he spoken it and shall he not make it good okay so every time we read something in this book it's truth Okay. Verse 3, 
Again, for our purposes, the tempter is saying, okay, verse 3 says, And when he, the tempter, came, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command these stones to be made bread. It's the, wor- the word, word if is the word I. So Satan approaches Jesus, and he sa- he's, he's saying, hypothetically, if, hypothetically, if you are the Son of God, then turn these stones to bread. Are you following me? He comes to Jamie, hypothetically, if you are a daughter of God, show me, prove it. You know, it's almost like he's going to Jesus and he's saying, if you are the son of God, okay, if that's what you say, okay, if that's what you say, is that right? Well, if that's what you say, then he wants Jesus to prove it. Ladies and gentlemen, if present a hypothetical truth that must be understood, believed, and acted upon. Okay? What is the hypothetical truth here? Jesus is the Son of God. Did we not read that in Matthew chapter 13 through 17? The spoken word. The spoken word. Okay? So God had spoken to him. The And God had told him that you are my son. Jesus believed the spoken word. Okay? So we see then that the very first time this word is used, Jesus is confronted with knowing who he is, understanding who he is, believing who he is, and then acting out of who he is. Okay? The word if, ladies and gentlemen, is a faith word. Because you have to have faith in what is being told to you in order to believe it and act on it. If is also a fellowship word, as we have seen. Okay? Satan was trying to bait Jesus just like he baited Eve. He asked a question already knowing the answer. Lee, you say you're a son of God. Is that so? Does he already know the answer to that question? Yeah, he already knows the answer to the question. When it comes to tempting Lee, he wants to find out if Lee knows the answer to that question. Okay? And see, it says that if you... Satan said, okay, if you are the son of God, then I want you to turn these stones into bread. Now, see, so many times when a person talks about this passage, they really focus on, this, on Jesus turning the stones to bread, you know, whether or not he could have done that. The answer is yes. I just thought I'd just take the mystery out of it. Yes, he could have done that. You know why I know he could have done that? Because Satan asked him to do it. People, he asked him to do it. Satan knows your capabilities. Satan knows the authority that you have. And how did he want Jesus to do it? Speaking the word. Are you? Speaking the word is how he wanted Jesus to do this. Our authority as God's sons and daughters are in the words we speak when we believe what we say. I mean, it's easy to parrot what the word says. It's easy to do that. But deep down inside of you, where no one can see, where no one can examine you, Do you really believe what you are saying? Do you? If you see someone who is falling, head bleeding, struggling to get up, do you believe that you can go declare that person's healing 
and then that person gets up, may still have a little blood, but that person gets up whole, healed. Do you believe that? I mean, you, that's what the Bible says, right? We know that's what it says. We can tell you what it says, but do you believe it? This is what Satan is asking Jesus with the word if. I know you say you're the son of God. You may even believe that you're the son of God. But Jesus, I'm from Missouri. You have to show me. In that one little word, Jesus had the opportunity to disobey God by trying to prove something that he already knows is fact and is truth. When you know who you are, ladies and gentlemen, you don't have to prove it to anyone. You don't have to prove it. They will know it when they see you. They will know it when they see you. When you come into the room, they will know it, that there is a different presence entering into this room. They will know that there is light entering into this room when you enter in. You don't have to get a big bull horn and say, Barry is entering the room, son of God's approaching. <laughs> Ready to be prayed for, have all your prayers answered, Barry is here. <laughs> <laughs> that was the Pharisee walking down in front of the people so everyone could see him so everyone would think that this is the great man of God the one who has all the answers our father doesn't operate that way we have to have faith that what God has said is true and we have to get past the point of being able to just repeat it. We have to get to the point that there is nothing that can convince me otherwise that what God has said is not true. But Brother Barry, you're not seeing it in your life. It's still true. The word is not the issue. Barry is the issue. The word has put up a standard that Barry is still here working his way up to hit that standard. Are you following me? But see, we get discouraged because we know what the word says and we're not doing it because our faith is here and the faith that the word is asking us to have is here and we're here and we go through this thing about God is taking so long for me to get here. Ladies and gentlemen, at least you're going in that direction. Can you imagine how many folks in the body of Christ who are not even going in that direction? Okay. And when the tempter came to him, he said, if thou be the son of God, Command that these stones be made bread. Command that these stones be made bread. Jesus' response was simple, and we know it. Man shall not live by bread alone, but man's substance, man's life, comes from the Bible. Our substance, our life, comes from the Bible. Okay? That's the first time this word if, this hypothetical truth is mentioned. Okay. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, look at verse 9. 
It says, for ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. So the Bible says that we know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the first thing. We have to know the grace. So if you don't know the grace, you need to find out how you can know the grace. Okay? And you know the grace by getting into his word. Okay? But this is what I want you to see in relationship to knowing the grace. Look at verse 12. For if, you see the, it's a hypothetical truth, if there is be first a willing mind, it is accepted according to that a man hath, and not according to what he hath not. And I'm being redundant on purpose. The two words not is the word O-U. It means absolutely not. Okay? It means absolutely not. So what God is saying is that if you have a mind, if you have a heart that you want to give, and you don't have the amount that you want to give, that is not an issue for God. The issue for God is your heart. Now, the hypothetical truth is, and see, it's a very hard hypothetical truth for those who've been living under the tithe mentality. Because it says, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, but yet for your sake he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. Do you believe that? That's what that hypothetical truth is saying. Because if you have a ready mind, if you believe what has already been spoken, okay, if you believe that, then you will not be panic-stricken. Your heart will not be racing. You will not become so torn up on the inside because you don't have 10% to give to the Lord. Folks, there are people in the church, they will give the tithe before they pay their utility bill. They will give the tithe before they put food on the table. Because God says I'm supposed to give the tithe. We just saw, it says, Jesus is his grace that provides for us. And verse 12 says, if you believe that. So the onus then is on us to believe what the Bible says, to believe the written word. Are you, you, do you see where I'm going with all of this? Our response to the written word is whether or not it becomes a reality for us. Our response determines whether or not it becomes a reality for us. Look at 1 John chapter 4. This is one of those verses ladies and gentlemen, that the body of Christ will say, yes, I'm doing this, and they're lying. If God so loved the world, if God so loved us, the Bible says we ought to love one another. That word ought, it means because God loves us, we are obligated to love one another. Do you hear me? We are obligated to love one another. So when you hear folks talking about the president or talking about Nancy Pelosi or talking about anyone like that, they are not fulfilling that verse. Are you following me? And which means then, and but Brother Barry, what do you mean they're not fulfilling that verse? Listen to the words they speak. You know they're not fulfilling that verse by the words they speak. God has put so much authority in us. It's like we're just wasting it. 
because we're not living the way we're supposed to live. And when he says, if God so loved us, we are obligated to love one another, that means we have no choice. We have no choice. So the next time that a thought comes into your mind about the political situations or the cultural situations or whatever the case may be that are not in agreement with this word, kill it up here. Kill it up here. Don't give it life by speaking it. Because once you put it out there, you cannot get it back. Kill it up here. Don't let it come out of your mouth. Kill it up here. I think somewhere in the Bible it called it, 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 called it mortifying the deeds of the flesh. Okay? We're, we're, we're winding down. Look at John chapter 15. John chapter 15. I was hesitating because I didn't know if you wanted me to look at another one. John chapter 15. Look at verse 18. The hypothetical truth that it presents. If the world hates you, ye know that it hated me first. If the world hates you, we know that it hated me first. Well, Jesus, how do we know that the world is going to hate us because I said it. <laughs> because I said it. And so then we have to make a decision. And why did, why did the world hate Jesus? It's because of what he stood for. It's because of what he taught. It's because of what he believed. So Jesus is saying, my disciples are going to be hated just like I was hated. Now let's draw a little line here, ladies and gentlemen. You can be a Christian and not be a disciple. You with me? You with me? Because see, there are so many Christians who are not hated because they're going along They've compromised so they can get along so that people will like them. A disciple is going to have a lot of haters. It's going to have a lot. You, you are going to have a lot of haters. And so Jesus says, you know, you need to decide whether or not that's the life for you. You know, who's going to go decide to build something and not decide how much it's going to cost before you can build it? Who's going to go to war with another king without determining whether or not he has enough soldiers to really fight that king? So Jesus said, you need to decide, ladies and gentlemen, if the life of a disciple is for you. Because once you decide that a life of a disciple is for you, all hell is going to break loose. It's coming. The tempter, he's coming. Because he doesn't mind you being a Christian. He doesn't want you to be a disciple. Because, see, when you are a disciple, the works that I do, John chapter 14, verse 12, you shall do also, and greater things shall ye do because I have gone to my Father. <coughs> So when you are a disciple, you are, I watch too many, too many law shows, okay? When you are a disciple, you are a person of interest. <laughs> you are a person of interest, okay? You are going to be scrutinized. You are going to be examined because he's going to be constantly trying to find a way 
to get you off of that path of being a disciple. Okay? If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Jesus is presenting another hypothetical truth. If you were of the world, the world would hate its own. So what is Jesus saying? You have to understand me, disciples. You are not of the world. But Jesus, I'm here. I'm walking around. I'm experiencing it every day. Your spirit man is not of the world. Your spirit woman is not of the world. This flesh that Barry has, and I know it's pleasing to the eyes. <laughs> I know I know I understand that. This is my earth suit. This is on, this is my earth suit. It allows me to be here so that I can fulfill the word of God. That's my this is, Ladies and gentlemen, this, when you are born again, the, it, it only has one purpose, for you to be here to fulfill God's word. That's the only purpose your body has. It has no other purpose. None, not a zilch. I know you have jobs. I know you got to go to school. I know you have all these other things, but the purpose of your body is to fulfill the word of God. Okay? If you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Verse 20. Remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have not kept my saying, they are will keep, they, if they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. This is the verse we're going, to, we're going to close with this passage right here. We see that Jesus is speaking to us. He's saying, if they persecuted me, in other words, you have to understand what Jesus is saying, you have to believe what he's saying, and then you're going to act on what he's saying as if it's true. Because when you do that, you are going to start making your mind think differently. Did you hear me? You're going to start making your mind think and respond differently to the things of this life. You know, I get amazed and I'm closing, that you have Christians, you have theologians, you have preachers who say that for those of us who, su who have supported the president, who have supported the things he's done, and I'm not being political, I'm just making an observation. He says, what do you think that does to your Christian witness. Okay? I got news for you, ladies and gentlemen. Even if I disagree with everything the president does, if I, even if I talked about him like a lot of Christians talked about him, do you think that the world is going to think differently of me? You're still a Christian. The only thing you have done is you have aligned yourself with the world. But they still see you as being a Christian. You know why I know that? Because once you stop agreeing with them, they're going to attack you all over again. Are you with me? So how can you ruin your Christian witness by standing on godly principles. How can you do that? How can you do that? 
And I use the president as an example. I don't agree with a lot of things that he does. But see, the godly principle that I stand on when it comes to my president, 1 Timothy chapter 2, it says you pray for your leaders. It doesn't say you agree with them. It doesn't say you support everything they do. You pray for your leaders. And why, Bear, do I pray for my leaders? God so loved us, we ought to love, we are obligated to love one another. And the best way I can demonstrate my love for the president is praying for him. The best way I can demonstrate my love for anyone, ladies and gentlemen, is praying for them. That's the best way I can demonstrate my love. Because it transcends my emotions and puts me into fellowship with my father. And the more I am in fellowship with my father, the more my emotions will matter less and less and less. Can you imagine Jesus doing anything outside his father's will based on his emotions? Mm-mm. When Jesus got angry, got angry in the temple because of what they were doing with the money, the tax collectors and all that, don't you think God was angry too? Okay. The word if, ladies and gentlemen, and I encourage you to go home, pull out your Bible dictionary, or pull out anything that will allow you to see what the word if means when you come across them. Because each time we see the word if, i.e., in the New Testament, it's an opportunity for us to do a self-examination of our faith, our trust, and our belief in what the Bible says. When it comes to developing a more intimate fellowship with the Father and with Jesus, if puts the ball in our court. The responsibility belongs to us. The responsibility belongs to us. So I encourage you, ladies and gentlemen, it's a little word, but it's a little word that when you see it for what it really means and what it is, it gives you a different perspective on what the text is saying. Okay? Everybody please stand. The, the responsibility that we have as sons and daughters of God is a responsibility that for a lot, of, a lot of folks in the body of Christ, they're going to be very, very uncomfortable with. And that responsibility is if the Bible says that the Bible is true. If the Bible says that the Bible is true. It doesn't matter what Brother Barry says. It doesn't matter what Pastor Jim says. It doesn't matter what Brother Olay says. The, what the Bible says is true. And so whenever any of us do not agree with the Bible, the Bible is true. Okay? And I'm not speaking ill against pastor because pastor has told you over and over again. You don't just take my word for it. You get into it and make sure that what I'm telling you is right. Anyone who stands behind the pulpit, the lectern, would tell you the same thing. You check me out. Check me out. Because, see, that's your responsibility to your father. That's your responsibility to Jesus, to check me out. To make sure that what I am saying lines up with what this book says. Our father loves us so much that he has invested in us the authority of heaven. And so it's up to us to use that authority through the words we speak appropriately. Amen. Heavenly Father, I thank you in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for hanging on that tree for us, Jesus. Thank you for loving us so much that you were willing to endure the things that you endure so that we could have life everlasting. And Jesus, 
I can't speak for anyone other than Barry. From this day forward, I am not going to be a disappointment. From this day forward, I am going to pursue everything that you have for me to pursue. I am going to be the mirror image of you, Jesus. That is my pursuit. I am going to be your disciple, Jesus. That is my pursuit. That is where I'm going. That is my lifeblood. And I hope, ladies and gentlemen, that that is your lifeblood as well. So, Father, as we close, I just thank you that this afternoon we'll get some rest and be refreshed and bring with us an atmosphere of excitement and anticipation and expectancy to hear what Brother Lay is going to deliver tonight. We give you all the praise. We give you all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Good afternoon.